Four times a year, Shannons host their prestige online car auctions with very special cars from all over Australia, but open to bidders from all around the world. In a few weeks' time, it's their spring-timed online auction. You can watch it online. I was down there the other day, and bugger me, some of the cars they have going under the hammer are astounding. And yes, it's true, my magnificent turbo will be going under the hammer too, but today's not about my Porsche. I can't resist sharing some of these amazing cars with you. And bless their hearts, they've been happy to spend a lot of time showing me over them. So one by one, let's find the pick of the crop. We can't drive them, but in a few weeks we can buy them. So get ready, we're starting with something truly special. The most special car of all. <laughs> yeah, so hiding in the corner over here, we have our GD40 replica, which is just something to behold. Personally, this is my favorite car in the auction. I think it's a stunner. Um, just a beautiful from every angle. Um, I, I'd love to own a car like this. So we've got a, a scene oh, yeah. of 1966 Le Mans 24 hours oh, yes. um, with a bunch of GD40s. That was so the first time the GD40s won. They'd, they hadn't was. been very good before that, had they? No, they were um, unfortunately very unreliable until uh, Carol Shelby came and sorted the cars out and uh, they suddenly turned into a race winner. So 66 was the first year they won with the, the Mark II. Uh, we think this is the winning car hiding behind here. This oh, yeah. is of course the Le Mans start where they all ran across the track, jumped yeah. in, yep. took off like a rocket. Yeah, no seat belts. No seat belts. We've all seen the film Ford versus Ferrari. This was it oh, yeah. right here. Um, <gasps> and so we now very conveniently have a car to go with the, uh, the mural, which is very cool. So, so what we've got so, here is a replica. Yep. But a very, very good replica. Um, GD40 replicas, like Cobra replicas, tend to fall into two different categories. There are those that look a bit like a GD40, and then there are those that are a complete copy, a, a, a nut and bolt, as they say, a tool room copy, where every part is virtually interchangeable. And that's what we're looking at here. Um, the fellow that actually built this car was in New Zealand, a chap by the name of Frank Wig from Auckland. Oh yeah, oh, um, it's a Frank Wig car, okay. Yeah, so he and his son are still around, they still do a lot of motorsport in New Zealand. This car was the first of I think five or six that he made. Um, he was restoring an original car and with typical Kiwi ingenuity, um, and you know the Kiwis are probably the best in the business as far as building replicas, there's a real industry over there doing mm -hmm. everything from C types to you name it. Um, so he so had access to an original car. He took all the measurements off that car and being in the 1980s, he was able to actually access a lot more parts than are available these days. Mm -hmm. um, because so many of these have been built up, the store of original parts has been well and truly plundered over the last 30 years. So there's yeah. not many parts around that you can access yeah. anymore. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a very, very accurate copy. And to be honest, most people would be fooled. Um, the dimensions are pretty well spot on. Yep. So it's not uh, a space frame, it's, no. it's a proper monocoque. It's a proper steel monocoque car, which again, wow. a, lot of, uh, a lot of the copies use space frames, tubular chassis, whatever kind of frames people came up with. Um, sometimes to meet safety regulations for kit cars, sometimes to make the car more comfortable, a bit more space inside. Um, quite often you'll find them, they have the gear shift, the transmission tunnel in the, uh, the centre there, centre shift whereas this car's got it where it's supposed to be. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, but, you know, all the little details that just set this car apart, the BRM wheels, um, you know, so many details on the interior. Yeah. Wow. Everything's just what you call period correct. And, you know, I've seen a few GD40s. I've been lucky enough to go to Goodwood a few times. Mm -hmm. I've been to Laguna Seca, watched the car racing in America, mm -hmm. and seen quite a few real GD40s over the years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this car just looks right. Registered. Or it has was, been. It was registered here in Sydney on historic plates, and there's no reason why it couldn't be again. Wow. And it's competed? Didn't do a great deal until the early 2000s when the current owner decided he wanted to do Target Tasmania. So. In this? In this thing, yeah. He was a brave man. With Targa, he basically um, prepared the car, and I think for the first year was 2005. Mm. Um, it was actually painted black then. So anyone who's been to Targa would have seen the car when it was black, not oh. yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and he subsequently changed the colour because people couldn't see the car. Yeah, yeah, it's 40 inches high. Yeah, tiny, so very easy to disappear on the, a black the, road. The Messerschmitt's taller than it. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, brave, brave uh, owner and his co-driver driving this thing. We'll just lift the engine and cover up and have a look under here. 
And there we are, 302 cubic inches. Yes. As did the Le Mans Carin 68 running the Webers. Yes. 48 correct. IDA down draft Webers. That's it. And it's got a ZF five speed. Which is correct as well. Which is period correct. Yeah. Yeah. So Wow, that is beautiful. Yeah. Remind me, the year before they, they ran a big blocks Ford 27 7 litre, didn't they? Yeah, they did. So the factory in 60, I think 65 was the first year they experimented with the, the 7 litre 427 motor. 66 was the first year at one. 67, yes. they then built the um, Mark IV, which was a, a composite chassis. It was a prototype, so a very different sort of car. Yep. And they won again. But in 68, the regulations changed and essentially, Prototypes were limited to three litres capacity, which meant all the manufacturers like Ferrari ended up using designs that were effectively Grand Prix cars with a two-seater body on them, and they didn't have the reliability. This car, you know, its Achilles heel in some senses was its weight. It was a heavy car by race car standards, but in 68 and 69, that became its virtue. The fact that it could outlast all these prototypes in a 24 hour race, it just kept going and going and going. But they're only a thousand kilos. That's, I suppose that's not heavy by race cars. Not, not by today's standards, but no. in then. the era they were known to be a, a heavy car. Okay. They weren't the quickest car in 68 and 69, yep. but they were the most reliable car by then. And I guess the key in 68 and 69 was um, John Wire ran the, uh, the golf racing team which is the famous orange and blue livery that we all know. Yes. And his, he was renowned for his preparation of the cars. Yep. When those cars went on the track, they would finish. And yep. that's what happened in 68 and 69. And remarkably, the, the same chassis actually won those two events. Okay. Chassis 1075. So yep. it's probably the most valuable of all the GD4. Which is extremely close to what this Very this similar car to is. this. The only major difference was in 68 and 69, they tire technology and had got better and they were building um, they, they changed the rear bodywork here oh, to yeah. cover the, the bigger wheels and tyres. Okay. But effectively the car was virtually the same as what we see here. Fabulous. Well we've all seen the movie Ford versus Ferrari and that's the story of the 66 year. But yes. the, this is but the 68 Le Mans winning car. It, yeah, it kept going. That one, that one had a holly. That yes. had a big four barrel holly on it I think in 66. But this yeah. one's got the period correct for 68. Yeah. Ford Weber's. tried all sorts of different things with the GTs. They, um, they even ran automatic transmissions in them. Do they? Yeah, just as, a, as wow. a trial thing. Do you want to fire it up? Absolutely. You've got to hear this thing run. The handle is just like a Tesla. The easiest way to jump in is just to put your feet on the, uh, on the sill. Right. Are we putting on the harness or not? Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. But I'll, but I'll move the buckle fast. out of the way because I don't want to sit on the buckle. No. Okay. Pretty cosy in here. Wait on the tunnel. Wait on the sides. Don't put your weight on the seat. Feet in. Just. Oh, wait, smoke. Now I'm just going to bend. Don't decapitate yourself. No. Tuck your head to one side. Yep. That's it. I'm lucky because I've got what they call the gurney hump here, which uh, and they was didn't... named after Dan Gurney because he was tall and he couldn't sit in a car like this with a helmet on wow. without having a bump in the roof. Wow. This is not the kind of race car I would want to, to <laughs> race in, <laughs> let alone do 250 miles an hour. It's a little claustrophobic, but I think you would get used to it, like all things. And what I love about this car, again, is just the, the period correct dash. This dash is exactly how a genuine GT40 would look. You've yep. got your Smith's gauges, yep. everything's in the right place, the rev counter right in front, mm -hmm. speedo out there. No one cares. It only goes no to 200 cares. miles an hour. <laughs> For Le Mans, that's not nearly enough. Yeah, but I guess the important thing is, you know, the red line's there, yep. you've got your temperature gauges, everything's where you need it to be. Um, and the big lumpy 302. A big lumpy 302 right behind you. A couple of fuel cells on either side of you. Yep, yep. Just where you want them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's see if we can get it to fire up. Seriously? All right. Uh, so the technique to start it is pretty simple. First, we get some power with one of the kill switches. Mm. Get the fuel pump to uh, prime Fu the carbies. Good. First kick. That is ridiculous. What a shame we're parked in. We can't go anywhere. Yes. Sounds like it's, sounds like it's got a fairly lumpy cam in it as it well. It does, yeah. Yeah, so you obviously can switch tanks as you need to. Keep them nice and balanced. Yeah, 
has to be done manually to switch between the two. Yeah, there's a there's a pump here to operate each one. Yep. And you've got two fuel gauges there to tell you which ones. And I see you've got a where the gear changes where it should be, right yes, hand. Exactly. It hasn't so, been put in the middle. No, most of the replicas you'll be able to buy these days have got the gear change in the middle there, but uh, again this is exactly how it's supposed to be. The thing that strikes me is the difference between a 302 in something like a, an old XT GT yep. versus something like the GD40 where you know it's got a, a totally different setup on it yep. and it sounds magnificent. I mean, just give it a blip at the throttle. The way it revs, it's obviously got a light flywheel too. It just revs right up to the red line really quickly. Yep. Made that. Pretty cool. This is real race car. Absolutely. Better, better, before we gas everybody, you better throw it. Turn it Whoa. all off. <laughs> Something else. Isn't it just? Yeah. But as you said before, you'd have to be a brave individual to oh. uh, do Targa in a, in a car like this. As I say, I've done eight Targas mm. and I've come off just once or twice. Yep. Once, once seriously, once not. But mm. the rain on Aerosmith when it's all fast, eights, nines, tens, mm. and you're mm. doing 200 k's an hour mm. plus for a lot of it. Doesn't bear uh, thinking about it. And aquaplaning yeah. with the, those wide tires. Yeah. It, it's not. Yeah. And and safety aids. What have we got? We got ABS. And uh, airbags. And, yeah. No. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a helmet. <laughs> um, they were not a fragile car. No. Um, you hit something in one of these, and, and odds are you were going to be okay. Um, the the monocoque itself took the impact. Everything around the car was sacrificial, needless to say. Um, but this central monocoque here with a built-in cage. Yep. was designed to protect the driver and um, they did a, a pretty good job of doing that to be honest. You couldn't possibly have a, a, a navigator in here unless they're about four foot tall. No, that's right, you'd, you'd need to employ a jockey I think to, yeah. uh, to be but, a co-driver. But, but, but getting out, if, you, if you're wedged yeah. in the trees or down a cliff or on your side or upside yeah. down, yeah. you've got a serious problem. Yeah, not a lot of fun. So this is going to be one of the last lots of the auction? Yes, this is one of the stars. Um, look, we're quoting a range of around 140 to 160. Uh, which is well under what it would cost to build an equivalent car today. Um, that seems really cheap. For this. It, it's incredibly good value, to be honest. Um, you know, I think this car has a lot of potential as either just a, a fantastic weekend road car, or if you wanted to um, go a little bit further with it without having to change the car radically, mm. you could actually get it to a point where it was FIA eligible um, to run in some historic events. Mm. Um, because it is such an accurate copy. Um, and the sad thing is we don't have any GT40s left in Australia. No. Um, there used to be a few here, but this, uh, wow. there's just none left. Hope it stays here. Yes. You definitely. know, it's, as much as I like the Golf livery, it's mm. really nice to see one that isn't mm. with number six, Jackie X's number on the door, number nine That's being right. Rodriguez. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a, different, yeah. yeah. And look, you know, they, they made roughly 100 GT40s in the day people painted them in all kinds of colour combinations. Yeah. So this car is a bit of a blank canvas in a sense. You could, if you wanted to change it, you could paint it any way you like. Yeah. Um, or just keep it as it is. And the cool thing about it is it's got an amazing patina. I mean, it actually looks and feels like yeah. an old race car, it, it, it? It, it? Well, it has raced. It's, yeah. it, is a, it is an old, it race, is an old car. race car. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's got its own story and its own history now, which is good. There we go. Fabulous. Gently, Bentley. That's all right. <laughs> and on the centre tunnel, get your weight up. Mate, thank you very much for that. No, my pleasure. So there you are. The auction runs from November 8th to 15th, 2022. In my experience, Shannon's price estimates are often pretty accurate. So if you're bidding around $160,000 Australian, there's a good chance you'll end up owning this car. It strikes me with the Australian dollar and UK pound at real lows, this car would probably be very attractive and quite cheap to US buyers right now. It would be a shame to see it go overseas. Hey, why don't you leave a comment as to what you think it'll sell for? And tell us, from what you've seen in this video, which car you'd like me to check out next. Subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see that giant Packard V12 or the Lancia Delta Integrale Evo Rally car. Those ones coming up next. And before you ask, no, I don't get any commission or fee from Shannon's. I should, shouldn't I? See you next time. Oh hey, you made it right through to the end of the video. Congratulations. Thank you for watching. If you like what you see, please share it with your motoring friends. And above all, click the little subscribe thing down here so you can see the latest videos when we bring them out, hopefully each week. I look forward to seeing you soon.